So we've seen how to measure performance for a single program. Now, usually you don't measure a system based on behavior on a single program. Its performance is usually measured over a large number of programs that have widely varying behavior. So essentially you construct a benchmark suite, which is a collection of different programs. So SPEC is an organization which has members from most of the major chip companies. And the members of SPEC essentially come up with a collection of programs that are important to their respective consumers. So these programs have a wide variety of characteristics. And SPEC 2006 is an example of a benchmark suite that has 12 integer and 17 floating point applications. So when you want to measure a system, you run each of these 29 programs on your system, measure the execution times, and then combine them all to produce one single SPEC rating. So the SPEC rating is determined by the geometric mean of the performances of each individual program, right? So you measure the execution time of a program, take the inverse to get its performance, and then you multiply the performances of these 29 programs. And after you, after you multiply it, you take the 29th root of, of that product, right? So essentially the geometric mean of two numbers is obtained by multiplying those two numbers and taking the square root. Geometric mean of three numbers is taken by multiplying the three numbers and then taking the cube root. Right? So for spec, you're multiplying 29 numbers and then taking the 29th root. Now, instead of geometric mean, you could have also taken other measures such as arithmetic mean to summarize the behavior of multiple programs and represent them all with one number. But spec has chosen the geometric mean. Now, before I finish this lecture, I just want to go through a few common principles of computer design. The first is Amdahl's law. And what it says is that performance improvements are a function of the bottleneck of that given component, right? So when you look at a system, there are many different components, let's say the memory system, the disk, the processor. And if I choose to improve the processor, the improvement cost to the overall system is a function of how important the processor itself is. Okay, so I think this is best explained with this example over here, where I'm assuming a web server, where the applications spend about 40% of their time doing number crunching in the CPU, and about 60% of their time doing input or output, maybe getting data from disk. Now, if I improve the CPU, that's only going to reduce this fraction of the total execution time, right? So if, if the program takes 100 seconds to finish, essentially 40 seconds are in the CPU and 60 seconds are in disk. Now, if I come up with a CPU that is 10 times better, right, that will shrink this fraction down to four seconds, right? If it's 10 times better, what used to take 40 seconds now take, takes four seconds. And this disk execution time is going to remain that way, right? If, if you have, if, if the disk is left unchanged, it's still going to take 60 seconds reading things in and out of the disk, right? So the program is going to overall take 64 seconds to finish, right? So this is a 36% reduction in execution time and a speed up of 1.56, okay? And what Andal's law states that the reduction in execution time is never going to exceed 40% because the processor is accounting for 40% of overall execution time, right? So if I want to improve the CPU, I cannot expect uh, an execution time reduction of higher than 40%. If I'm improving the disk, I cannot expect an execution time reduction of greater than 60%. So here are a few other common principles. You know, one is of course Amdahl's law that we just talked about. A second common principle is that systems are always dissipating energy even when they are idle. And this is because of leakage energy that is there in processors or in any kind of system where you can't completely shut off the power supply. Okay, so if a system is operating at high utilization, it may consume, let's say, 100 watts of power. At low utilization or even zero utilization, that system will typically consume, let's say, close to 30 watts. Right? And that's because of the leakage energy. Now, you know, if you do observe that the system is at zero utilization, you can put it in some kind of deep sleep or hibernation mode, and that can reduce the 30 watts down to, let's say, 5 watts or 10 watts. Okay, so, you know, be aware that systems are leaking significant amounts of energy even when they're idle. Now, I didn't quite define energy. Energy is nothing but power into time. Okay, so a system that consumes 100 watts and runs for 10 seconds to execute a given program ends up consuming 1,000 joules of energy. Okay, now, if I improve performance, I'm essentially reducing execution time. 
and that also ends up reducing energy consumption right so usually when you improve performance you also cause a reduction in overall energy because the program is just basically running more efficiently the next common principle is the 90-10 rule which states that 90% of the execution time of a program is attributed to only 10% of the entire program code so essentially there's a small portion of every program that gets invoked repeatedly and that accounts for most of the final execution time so when you're trying to optimize the program you should try to find that small piece of code that accounts for a large fraction of overall execution time the final principle is the principle of locality and, and there are two different kinds of locality the first one is temporal locality that states that when you touch some data or when you execute some code there's a very good chance that you will revisit the same data or the same piece of code in the very near future. The second kind of locality is spatial locality that says that if I'm touching a certain piece of code or a certain piece of data, there's a very good chance that in the near future, I'm going to touch data or code that sits right next to that initial piece of data or code. That means you tend to touch neighboring blocks of data or code over a period of time. So having covered these, these common principles, uh, let me just do a quick recap of what we've seen so far and in the next set of videos, I'll start looking at instruction set design. So until now, I've kind of motivated the course, explained why you know both computer science and computer engineering majors need to understand hardware design. Knowledge of hardware helps you write better software. It helps you write programs that are multi-threaded. It helps you manage the memory system better. It also helps you write compilers and operating systems which are very closely tied to the underlying hardware. We've also talked about important trends. So we talked about Moore's law, how it's declining, how that has led to a drop in uh, performance improvements every year. Uh, we've talked about the power wall, which plays a huge role in these performance improvements. Uh, and then we've talked about how to reason about performance, how to measure execution time, how execution time itself is broken down into the number of instructions, the length of every single clock, and the cycles per instruction. In the next set of videos, we'll start looking at assembly instructions and instruction set design.